Hi everyone! Welcome to our workshop on visual recognition for images, video and 3D as part of the ECCV 2020 conference. This talk will focus on the functionality and performance of PyTorch 3D, which is a library for deep learning with 3D data. My name is Nikila Ravi, and I'm a research engineer in the Facebook AI research team working on computer vision and 3D understanding. And I'm presenting on behalf of the whole PyTorch 3D team. In this talk, I'll cover four main areas. First, I'll give some context on the need for a 3D deep learning library. I'll then share some of the key goals of PyTorch 3D. I'll deep dive into the different components and explain the functionality along with code examples and some performance benchmarks. And then I'll spend a bit more time explaining differentiable rendering and finally share a few simple example use cases which are available as tutorials. To motivate the need for a deep learning in 3D library, let's take a step back and think about what is needed to train a deep learning model in 2D, for example, for image classification. The end-to-end -end pipeline requires taking inputs which are batched, for example, a batch of images, passing them through efficient operations like convolutions, passing them through loss functions, and finally, having support for gradients everywhere so that you can backpropagate through the whole pipeline. Now, optimized implementations of a lot of these components for 2D are already available. But now let's think about what's needed for deep learning with 3D data. So let's look specifically at the differences between deep learning with 2D and 3D data. One training example in the 2D case might be an image of size 1024 by 1024. In the 3D case, a single mesh can have tens of thousands of vertices and faces. Next, let's consider batching. So a standard practice in deep learning is to feed models with batched inputs at train time and accumulate gradients within that batch. So this is done for many reasons, including that it leads to more robust training. For images, batching is simple, as it can be represented by a four-dimensional tensor. But meshes are more complex than images. A mesh is a collection of vertex coordinates and faces which index into the vertices. Meshes of different sizes can cause a number of challenges. So what if you have one mesh which has 2,930 vertices and another mesh which has 24,604 vertices. How would you batch these together? It's not entirely clear what the best way is to do this. Lastly, I want to touch upon the idea of differentiability. In the 2D space, such as recognition systems like mask RCNN, both the data and the 2D operations live on a 2D grid. A shape is just on or off squares on a 2D grid. For example, this is how we try to approximate something like a 2D silhouette. Both the prediction and the ground truth data live on 2D grids, and thus don't need any exceptional handling of data or operations in order to propagate gradients. 3D voxels are similar to 2D masks in that they are confined to a regular grid. But 3D meshes or 3D point clouds are not confined to have XYZ coordinates to be on grid locations. They are continuous representations. So to build operations that can propagate back to the continuous 3D space, such as graphics operators like rendering, we need to reformulate these operations either in the forward or backward pass or both to support differentiability. This is where PyTorch 3D comes in. We've created a library of optimized and reusable components for 3D deep learning research tasks and aim to help accelerate research in this field. The goals of PyTorch 3D are to combine the features of a good deep learning library, so being fast, modular and differentiable, with the features needed for working with 3D data namely supporting different 3D data formats, heterogeneous batching, and implementations of common 3D operators. 
I'll now shift to talk about the structure of the code base and deep dive into some of the key components. PyTorch 3D has multiple layers. The foundation layer consists of data structures for 3D data, data loading utilities, and composable 3D transforms. The data structures handle all the batching logic and enable the operators, loss functions, and rendering to efficiently support heterogeneous batching. We found that batching measures requires different batching strategies and the flexibility to be able to move from one representation to the other. This is because different operators might be more efficient with different representations of the data. So this is why we created meshes, a data structure for batching heterogeneous meshes. Meshes takes its input the vertices and faces for a batch of meshes. You can start by defining a batch of meshes as a list of tensors. Here, there is a list of vertices for each mesh, and there will be a corresponding list of the faces. We can then easily switch to a packed representation, which is just a different view on the same data. With this representation, we need some auxiliary information, for example, the first indices into the packed tensor for each batch element. The packed representation is useful for operators like graph convolution. We might then need to reshape the vertices to add back in the batch dimension, and this involves padding the vertices based on the number of vertices of the largest mesh in the batch. This might be useful for an operator such as vertex align. We can see why this flexibility is important by having a look at the architecture diagram for a 3D model such as Mesh RCNN from ICCV 2019. The PyTorch 3D meshes data structure is used throughout, and the representation of the vertices and faces in the batch is interchanged multiple times during the end-to-end -end loop. For example, we start with the list representation. The vertiline operator takes the padded vertices, and immediately after this, the graph conv operator is more efficient with packed vertices and faces. Encapsulation of the bookkeeping and logic inside the mesh's data structure is what makes this possible. Here's a quick code example. We start by importing the meshes class and defining a batch of meshes as a list of vertices and faces. The different representations can be accessed by calling the class methods. For example, we can get the packed vertices. We can also access the auxiliary tensors which are computed internally. And finally, we can retrieve other computed properties such as the edges and the face normals. Another set of useful components are the IO utilities and 3D transforms. A common task for almost all projects is loading data from file. PyTorch 3D provides methods for loading meshes from OBJ files. Here we load the vertices, faces and auxiliary information. The faces and orgs variables are in fact named tuples which contain a number of different variables. We can get the face indices using the verts index key. The normals and texture information can be retrieved from the orgs tuple. In many cases, you will use the data from load obj to construct a meshes object. In this case, you can use the load obj's as meshes function to directly load a mesh from file into a meshes object. The batched mesh is of type meshes and in this example contains three meshes. Transforming 3D data is another common task. PyTorch 3D has a general purpose transforms 3D class with subclasses to support different types of transforms. We can create separate translate and rotate transforms both of which can be independently applied to a tensor of XYZ points, or they can also be composed to create one combined transform. You can also use the transform methods directly on the transforms 3D class to compose the transforms. So here we have a XYZ scaling followed by a translation. Next, let's look at some of the optimized operations in PyTorch 3D. K nearest neighbors for d dimensional points are used in chamfer loss, normal estimation, and several other point cloud operations. 
For a given point P, the goal is to find the closest K points in cloud Q. We implement exact KNN with custom CUDA kernels that natively handle heterogeneous batches. Our implementation uses template metaprogramming to individually optimize each DK pair. We compare against Spice, which is a fast GPU library for KNN. The PyTorch 3D implementation is tuned for D less than or equal to 4 and K less than or equal to 3. Vice targets a different portion of the design space, and it doesn't handle heterogeneous batching. It's optimized for high dimensional descriptors, and it also scales to billions of points. In our comparison, we first look at the difference in performance with K equals 1 and varying numbers of points in each point cloud. In terms of speed, we are approximately five times faster than FICE. And memory-wise, the PyTorch 3D implementation has the same memory usage. Memory-wise, the PyTorch 3D implementation has the same memory usage. For the next benchmark, we vary the number of nearest neighbors. In the case of low-dimensional descriptors, for example, D equals 3, we see that the PyTorch implementation is faster. Overall, PyTorch 3D KNN provides a fast option for the batched 3D problems we encounter in 3D deep learning research. Here is a quick code example of how to use the KNN function. So we import KNN points from the ops module and then initialize two random tensors. We can call the KNN points method with the points and the desired value of K. Another operator which is used frequently with meshes is graph convolution. Each vertex in the mesh can have an associated feature vector. Graph convolution computes new feature vectors for each vertex, propagating information along the edges of the mesh. For one particular node, this involves two steps. Gathering the features of all the adjacent nodes, and summing them, and then adding them back to the node's own feature vector. The code for this calculation is actually fairly simple and straightforward and takes only a few lines of code in PyTorch. However, there is a gathering and scattering step which is very slow in PyTorch. We benchmarked a naive PyTorch implementation with an optimized CUDA implementation that we have in PyTorch 3D. We used heterogeneous batches of meshes sampled from ShapeNet. In terms of performance, the CUDA version in PyTorch 3D is up to 30% faster than the naive PyTorch implementation in terms of both speed and memory usage. Here's an example of how to use the graph convolution function from PyTorch 3D. GraphConv is available in the ops module of PyTorch 3D. It can be initialized using the input and output dimensions, as well as the uh, initialization function for the weights tensor and whether the graph is directed or undirected. And by graph, here I mean the mesh. We can then call the conv function with the packed vertices and edges. The next set of components, which are required for many tasks, are loss functions. Let's take the example of chamfer loss, which is a method of comparing two sets of point clouds. For example, these points might be sampled from the surface of meshes. Chamfer loss is used as a loss function in many 3D deep learning research tasks. For each point in set 1, which might be the prediction, we need to find the nearest neighbors in set 2, which might be the ground truth, and then vice versa. This is a fairly simple calculation which can be done with only a few lines of code in PyTorch. The bottleneck, though, is a nearest neighbor calculation, which requires calculating a pairwise distance matrix and then finding the minimum value. This is very memory intensive in PyTorch. And this calculation is done in every iteration of the training loop, so it's really important that it's efficient. We found that doing this calculation in a fused CUDA kernel is much faster. We compare the time and memory usage for the naive vectorized implementation with the optimized fused CUDA kernel for heterogeneous batches of point clouds. We notice that the CUDA version reduces time and memory by more than 12x. And in addition, 
With the naive approach, we encounter out of memory errors for point clouds with points greater than 10K. So this limits the scale and resolution of the data we can deal with. Here's a quick code example of how you might use chamfer loss. We import the chamfer distance function along with two helper functions, one to create a spare mesh and another function to differentiably sample a point cloud from the surface of the mesh. We initialize two spheres of different topologies and sample 5,000 points from the surface of each mesh. And then finally use these points to calculate the chamfer loss. In this final section, I want to deep dive into rendering and differentiable rendering and explain the design choices made for the PyTorch 3D differentiable renderer implementation. Going back to the mesh RCNN diagram, the input here is an image and the output is a mesh. But what about the reverse, going from mesh back to an image? Rendering is a process of generating a 2D image from a 3D model. It's been studied extensively in the graphics community, but the idea of adding gradients to make the step differentiable and using this step for deep learning is a relatively new and exciting area. It opens a new door for research by enabling us to relate 2D pixels back to the 3D properties of the 3D model, such as the positions of the vertices. Rendering consists of two steps, rasterization and shading. The rasterization step can be further broken down into two steps. The first step involves looking at the relative position in XY of the triangle faces to see which pixels it intersects with. The second step is called Z buffering, which involves looking at the distance from the image plane to each of the mesh faces and determining which is the closest. Both the steps in rasterization involve discrete sampling, which is non-differentiable. The second step in rendering is shading, where additional properties of a scene, such as lights and texture, are taken into account to give a color to each pixel. When it comes to making this rendering process differentiable, we're definitely not the first people to think about this idea. There are several existing papers which address these problems in different ways. We particularly liked the soft rasterizer approach and took some of the ideas and added our own innovations. I'll explain later why we think our method is more suited for experimentation. So what does having a differentiable rendering step in a training loop mean? Let's start by literally setting the scene. In a scene, we might have an object such as a mesh. This could have an associated texture map. There might be light sources. There's also going to be a camera, which is the viewpoint from which the image is generated. Now, how do all these scene properties come into play in differentiable rendering? Each of these properties could be a variable which we want to learn. For example, the position of the camera, the intensity of the light, the position of the mesh vertices. The forward pass of a differentiable renderer might look something like this. First, we transform the input data using the camera properties. Then we pass this through a renderer to generate an image. So remember, this includes rasterization and shading. The image might be used as part of a loss function and finally, we want to propagate gradients back through the whole system and update the scene properties. This is where the renderer needs to be differentiable so we can learn the scene properties. So going back to the question of why traditional rendering is not differentiable, let's look more closely at the two steps involved in rasterization. For a given pixel, if there are two triangles which intersect with it that are overlapping, I mentioned previously that the color of the closest face is assigned to the pixel. So in this case, the pixel color would be yellow. If we were to then move the yellow triangle by a small amount in the Z direction, what would now happen to the pixel color? Now the pixel overlaps with the red triangle instead of the yellow. 
so we see that the pixel color undergoes a step change to go from yellow to red. This step change is not differentiable. One solution is instead of returning the closest face to the pixel, is to return the top k closest faces. In soft rasterizer, they look at every single face for a particular pixel, but we suggest that looking at the top k should be enough, where k is a user configurable parameter. This means that even occluded faces can contribute to the value of a pixel, and more importantly, the gradient from one pixel can propagate back to far-reaching vertices and occluded faces. The second problem is determining whether a pixel is covered by a triangle based on the 2D relative distance between the pixel and the triangle. Now we are looking in the xy plane. We again see a similar problem to the z-buffering case when a face is moved in the xy direction. So for a given pixel, here the center of the pixel is inside the blue triangle. And if this was the closest face in the z direction, the color of this pixel would be blue. Now let's consider what happens when we shift the blue triangle by a small amount in the x direction. The pixel now doesn't overlap any faces. So the color undergoes a step change to go from blue to having no color. Again, the step change is not differentiable. We can solve this by adding a small blur value in the xy direction around each face. And this, combined with storing the top k values and blending them, will enable the rasterization process to become differentiable. In PyTorch 3D, we made several key design decisions, which differentiate our implementation from soft rasterizer, and I'll explain each point in turn. So first, we have separate rasterizer and shader modules. We have a two-step process where we go from a coarse to a fine rasterization, and this enables significant speed up. We return the top K faces from rasterization. We support heterogeneous batching, and the shading step is entirely in PyTorch. We also support rendering of both point clouds and meshes. First, we separate the rasterizer and shader into separate modules, instead of having one monolithic CUDA kernel. Inside the rasterizer CUDA kernel, we have a two-step process. The image is split into a grid of coarse tiles, and faces are culled if they don't fall within these tiles. In the second step, we do pixel-wise rasterization based on the reduced subset of faces. We output four intermediate variables for each pixel, which we call the fragment data. This includes the z-buffer, 2D Euclidean distance, barycentric coordinates, and the face indices. In addition, as I mentioned, we return the top k values for each of these variables. In the shader, we continue to keep the top k values while applying shading and texturing. And finally, in the blending step, aggregate across the top k values. The rasterization is in CUDA for efficiency, but the rest of the pipeline is in PyTorch for increased modularity and ease of experimentation. Here is a quick code example of how to set up a renderer with PyTorch 3D. First, we need to import the necessary components from the renderer module. Next, we'll initialize the camera, and here we use a perspective camera and the look at transform with position, elevation, and azimuth rotation angles to determine the rotation and translation transforms. Next, we can initialize the rasterization settings, which include the faces per pixel, which correspond to the k parameter, so this determines the top k values which are returned from the rasterizer, and we also set the image size. For a full explanation of the parameters, you can refer to the PyTorch 3D documentation and the tutorials. We initialize a renderer by composing a rasterizer and a shader. There can be many different types of shaders, and it's also very easy to create your own. Finally, we can render a mesh to an image by just calling the forward pass of the renderer. If the mesh or any of the scene properties had requires grad equals true, i.e. we want to learn this parameter, we can easily backpropagate through the entire system. For example, given a ground truth output image, we can calculate a loss and then directly call backward on the loss. 
The modular rendering API enables easy experimentation. For example, in the blending step, where we aggregate across the top K values, it's easy to try different blending functions directly in PyTorch. The blending for this cube uses the softmax blending formulation from Soft Rasterizer, which can be written in a few lines of code in PyTorch. For mesh texturing, we offer several options. The simplest is having a d-dimensional texture for each vertex, for example, an RGB color, which can be interpolated across the face. This can be represented as a simple n by v by d tensor. Second, we can have vertex UV coordinates and a single texture map for the whole face. For a given point on the face, the color can be computed by interpolating the UV coordinates and then sampling from the texture map. This representation requires two tensors and is limited to only support one texture map per mesh. In more complex cases, such as shape net meshes, there are multiple texture maps per mesh, and some faces don't have texture, while others do. In this case, a more flexible representation is a texture atlas, where each face is represented as an R cross R texture map, where R is a, the texture resolution determined by the user. This is inspired by the soft rasterizer implementation. For a given point on the face, the texture value can be sampled from the per-face texture map using the barycentric coordinates of the point. This representation requires one tensor of shape n by f by r by r by 3. We did some benchmarks for forward and backward paths for textured mesh rendering in comparison with soft rasterizer with varying faces per mesh. We used heterogeneous batches of meshes sampled from ShapeNet and show the mean time for the forward plus backward pass compared to soft rasterizer. In terms of speed, we are more than four times faster. In terms of memory, the PyTorch 3D implementation has higher memory footprint, but this is due to the increased modularity of outputting the fragment data from rasterization. Overall, PyTorch 3D is significantly faster for large meshes higher resolution images, and heterogeneous batches. Finally, I want to showcase a few examples of how you can use PyTorch 3D in real-world problems. Now, all of these examples are available as tutorials on the PyTorch 3D GitHub repo. So we have 3D shape prediction, textured mesh rendering, combining these together to do 3D shape prediction with texture, bundle adjustment, and camera pose optimization using differentiable rendering. You can get started with PyTorch 3D without having to download anything. On the PyTorch 3D GitHub repo, we have several tutorials which take you step by step through these example use cases. They can also be run with Google Colab, so you can try the code without having to download or install anything. To conclude, PyTorch 3D is a fast, modular, and differentiable library for 3D deep learning with many common 3D operators, differentiable rendering, and heterogeneous batching support. We hope you find PyTorch 3D useful for your research, and you can find the code on GitHub and access the tutorials and documentation on the pytorch3d.org website. If you have any questions, feel free to find me on Twitter, and thanks for tuning in.